so much. It's, it's really great to be here. And this is the topic that, um, that uh, Richard proposed for me. And I thought, well, uh, uh, maybe a little dry. No offense. So I sort of thought, well, maybe I'll spice it up with this question. Are the politics of MECFS as turbulent as the US's federal politics? Uh, and, and, and of course, the, the answer is no, because there is nothing. I, and I thought you could put any, any noun in there for MECFS. There's nothing as turbulent as the US federal politics. So I'm going to go back to the, the original um, topic and talk a little bit about um, uh, what's happening in the U.S., a, a little bit of an overview um, about, uh, uh, about it. Um, and I think I, I would just start by saying I've been here two days now, and, you know, I, I am a patient, I, um, and I will speak very quickly. And part of this, my friends tell me, it's because when you spent, when you spent a year in bed in your mid-30s and you were never sure that you'd ever get out of bed, uh, that really causes you to use every single minute. And so I do tend to talk very quickly, and so if, I, if it's too much, let me know. But um, I've been involved in ME uh, as a person with the disease now for 32 years, and then moved into this role five years ago. So I feel as though, hey, you know, I know what's going on in the whole world of ME. And then I spent two days here in Europe at the conference, and I really realized how much I didn't know about what's happening in Europe. And, and, and it's extraordinary. And when I then began to think about, you know, what are the, you know, this is a disease that knows no national boundaries, right? We're all on the same team here. Um, but what does differ is our government and our government agencies and how they work. And the other key element of difference is our uh, medical, uh, our clinical medical de healthcare delivery systems. And those, those two, I want to talk a little bit about that and how it impacts the differences in ME uh, in, in Europe and in the U.S. And of course, um, I really have learned so much from everyone here in the last two days, and I feel as though this is just a little bit of giving back um, um, to help you understand perhaps a little bit about what's happening in the U.S. Um, so I will also just say that I'm, I'm taking on a dangerous task. We're a big country. I am one person. There are 325 million of us. And so um, I'm really, you know, working on the edge here. Um, uh, I will be talking about other organizations and federal agencies, and uh, I will leave things out, which were very important to many people, some of them in this room. And so I, I'm, I'm confident at the end of this there will be hell to pay, and you know, I've been in the MECFS world uh, for a while, and in, we, I think all of us in this world know you got to have a thick skin, so um, I will be fine, uh, and then I'll make some observations at the end. So let me first um, start, start by talking a little bit about um, so just overarching observations. I would say in the U.S., and um, I'm hearing the same sort of thing uh, here in, in Europe, that there's really been sort of this uptick in the last six to 12 months uh, in research. Um, there's, just, there's just more. Um, and I do think that in general in America, there's a new sense of hope among uh, patients, uh, people with ME and their caregivers, because there's finally, after decades, frankly, of really stagnant uh, situation are really seeing, seeing some hope. And that's a pretty great thing. You know, next I'll talk a little bit about coordination. I mean, coordination among org organizations and agencies. And we, know, we all know this is easy to say and admirable and the right thing to do and really difficult to do. I think, I think events like this, Richard, you know, extraordinary, um, bringing people together in the research arena. Um, it's very tough for lots of reasons that make sense um, for researchers to genuinely collaborate. Um, and I, I think that's a challenge. Uh, it is a challenge in the U.S. But I would say on the advocacy side in the U.S., we, we, there's really um, a coming together, um, an agreement on goals and, and uh, perhaps less agreement on methods, but we're having those discussions, and that's really important. So I think advocacy in the U.S. has gelled a bit. Um, the, 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 the biggest challenge in the U.S. Um, is really clinical care. <laughs> you know, and all these problems are intertwined. It's hard to pick the biggest problem, but we really have a clinical care crisis in the U.S., and I'll be talking more about that as we go forward. Um, there are essentially most Americans never get diagnosed. Most Americans with ME never get diagnosed, and even those who get diagnosed never get care. 
um, and that may be true here as well. Um, but it is a crisis. Um, and then I would just, I have to talk about the continued egregious underfunding. You know, when I look, when I try to sort of add up in my mind if there are three potential buckets of funding for this disease, federal government, whether it's Norway or England or uh, Britain or, or the U.S., federal government, private donations from families of people who suffer with this disease and private foundations. And for, it is still true that the, the majority of dollars overall, when I look at all the agencies in the U.S. who are working on it, still, the, the federal government's increasing in the U.S., but it is still primarily funded on the backs of patients and their families. Um, and that's, um, that's just wrong. Um, and it's very, it's been very tough to break through to private foundations. Um, and then one thing, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, I think that's very different in the U.S. than at least in the U.K. In the U.S., there, get, anyone want to guess how many um, ME organizations there are that provide direct support to patients, you know, helping to find a doctor, helping somebody understand the disease, uh, driving someone to uh, the doctor if it's needed? Well, well the answer is zero. There, there are zero um, uh, agencies in the U.S. that work on that. And lots of reasons for that. We're a big country, um, um, but uh, it's, it's, it is uh, very sad. Um, so let me um, go to the next slide here then. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about key, I'll start with research. Um, and so uh, uh, I do have to start with the federal government um, and talk about the new efforts at the NIH. For those of you who were here yesterday, you heard this, and for those of you who are going to be here tomorrow, you will hear this again, so I will not spend a lot of time on it, but the NIH has started a new program where they've put together three collaborative research centers um, to study various elements of ME, and this is new, and by God, it's great, and at the same time, it's you know, it's it's badly needed. Um, and then um, also doing at the CDC, there is an MCAM study that's in its fifth year, and we res we expect results soon. And at the NIH, there's a, a pretty intensive uh, intramural study. This is all good. Glad it's happening. But I, I I do have to say, you know, a number of us who are analytically inclined. You know, you, you can kind of do the math, and it's not that complex. You know, prevalence of the disease, severity of the disease, federal dollars spent on research. And you can compare that with, you know, pick, pick a disease, AIDS, MS, you know, Parkinson's, schi you know, schizophrenia, you know, you name it, all diseases that are awful. But when you look at that, I mean, there is, it is an objective fact that MECFS is woefully underfunded. In fact, it's underfunded by an order of magnitude. It literally is underfunded tenfold. And so that, as you can imagine, is one of the, one of the key uh, elements that we're working on. And I have to say, you know, it's a complex situation with, the, with both the NIH and the CDC, which are the primary uh, institutions. And, you know, it, um, we, we, it's important to sort of recognize the good new changes that are occurring and at the same time, you know, continue to urge more. And, and also, you know, as you get to know the folks in these agencies, you know, uh, we, there's a lot of, oh, the NIH needs to do more, and that's true. And at the same time, I look at people like, you know, Vicki Whittemore, who works at the NIH, who is, I think, one of the best friends to this disease, who's, who's working in a complex, difficult, challenging environment in which to move it forward. And so I think really quality advocacy means really understanding the problem from the point of view of the individuals you're trying to influence. Um, and we, we try to do that. Um, so uh, let me go in the right direction here. So then we talk about key U.S. research hubs. And I very cleverly put these in alphabetical order. <laughs> um, uh, so that it's not hell to pay, but these really, these are, these may or may not be names you know. And it's, it's pretty cool that we actually have eight of them here. Um, and, and when I say key research hub, it, it, I mean by that it, it's, a, it's an organization, all nonprofit or academic, that really is working intensively on MECFS with, with a multitude of staff. And you'll see that oh, the asterisk actually means um, that they are clinicians who are also doing research. And that's true of the Bateman Horn, it's true of um, Nancy Klimas' group, the fifth one down, and also the Stanford Chronic Fatigue Initiative with uh, Dr. Jose Montoya. And that's sort of a, a new trend. Um, 
that I've seen, which is clinicians who, who care deeply about the disease because they see the, the suffering daily, who, who turn to research. And that really enriches the work. Um, all of these, all these centers are doing great work, and we're, we're thrilled to have them. And of course, um, a, an important one is at Columbia University with Ian Lipkin, and of course, uh, uh, Mady Hornig as well. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll continue here. So those are, those are the research centers. And then there really are two different nonprofit organizations in the U.S. who are funding research. Um, the, the, the largest uh, is the Open Medicine Foundation, and Ron Davis spoke, and, and uh, we, we'll speak again tomorrow. And I think someone described the work there as a tour de force, and it clearly, clearly is. So the Open Medicine Foundation is doing extraordinary work at Stanford. They've announced a uh, new, um, a new effort at Harvard, um, and they also do uh, support other researchers. Our organization, the Solve MACFS Initiative, SMCI, um, is primarily a research organization, and we also do advocacy. Um, we can't separate them. You know, we we know that um, that it it will. The families who, who are funding MECFS research in the U.S. are never going to be sufficient to get us over the hump to get the millions upon millions of dollars that are needed to really solve this disease. So we have to do advocacy. I mean, we, we, it's a strategic decision that comes up regularly at our board, and we really feel that we have to do it. So when I look at, oh, first off, I, for those of you who were here yesterday, I hope you met um, Dr. Sadie Whitaker, who joined our organization recently as our new chief scientific officer, <coughs> and she had to leave, but she's a treasure. Um, <coughs> so let me talk first about the Ramsey Awards. And the, the concept here is to give seed grant awards annually to new researchers and to small, relatively small research um, dollars. <coughs> mm -hmm. um, with the idea of giving <coughs> new researchers an opportunity to prove a concept so they can later apply and have data and apply to NIH grants or grants from other nations. Um, and we currently are funding uh, 12 research institutions in seven countries. Um, so this is an important element of feeding the research pipeline, as we hoped and believe and are seeing more and more researchers show interest in it. The next uh, project here is the SMCI directed projects. Um, we had funded some work with Maureen Hansen at Cornell, <coughs> and we are about to start some new work at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center on metabolomics in New York City. The element of our program that is uh, <clears throat> new that I'm very proud of, we've had a biobank for, for eight years, and that means we hold samples uh, of uh, red, of blood, from individuals who are well characterized as being MECFS patients. And so we regularly provide samples to researchers. You know, we are a nonprofit patient driven organization, and so our only interest here is to facilitate research. So building a biobank and building a registry is a way to facilitate research. Um, so that when, uh, you know, often researchers have trouble finding. Uh, patients, finding appropriate patients. So we've had a biobank, we're going to continue to bu build the biobank, um, but we're adding on this summer a new registry um, that we're very excited about. I won't tell you too much, but it's really patient driven. It has a dashboard so that patients can interact easily, slide bars on level of privacy, on this area, this area, this area. So it's very, um, it was developed with the Genetic Alliance. And the important element here is our, our goal, our intent, is to build the largest patient registry uh, anywhere uh, for use by qualified researchers anywhere. Um, and so this will take some time, um, but there really are, you know, there's value to scale in really getting uh, all the patients in one location so that you can do, uh, you can do cross-sectional data, and then we also hope that we can do longitudinal study. We can support longitudinal studies over time. So more to come on that. We're also integrating the common data elements, which you'll hear more about uh, as well. Um, so, you know, just as a, a sort of a side note, there are really three, and I am leaving out some other folks who do extraordinary work, uh, but there are three major 
uh, organizations in the United States. The Open Medicine Foundation that really works on research and does extraordinary work. SMCI, which uh, is research and advocacy. And then ME Action, which puts on the millions missing, which I'm sure you all know about. And we all happen to be in Los Angeles. So it's an interesting coincidence. Um, so um, it's a little bit about that work. Um, uh, other U.S. federal government work, um, I, I won't talk too much about the NIH because Vicki Whittemore will do so, uh, and Ravi Nath, uh, Avi Nath will do that, talking about the, um, the intramural study and the, uh, the CRCs. Uh, and similarly, Beth Unger will be talking about the work at CDC, um, and so I won't go into too much detail on that. Uh, both of those agencies clearly are doing more than they had in the past. Um, I think advocates would say that it's really been a concerted, um, reasonably well orchestrated among ourselves push um, that is getting some traction. And of course, you know what I'll say, it's not enough. <laughs> and, uh, but, we, um, but we feel, but, and we will continue. And we will, um, uh, we do see results and it's gratifying when we do. So other federal government uh, issues. So, you know, at the first, the one that I should have put at the top here, the best thing that's happened in the United States for this disease is the Institute of Medicine report. Um, that report, as you may know, was commissioned by the federal government uh, and was published three full years ago, 20, spring of 2015. And, and as you probably know, really, you know, lots of pieces to it, not perfect, but it fundamentally said, yeah, this is a biological disease, this is not psychological, and has some specific recommendations on what ought to be done next. And I think many of us in the field were, you know, we were certainly elated. And much of the work we do now refers back to the Institute of Medicine report. And at the same time, I will say I was naive, and I am frankly shocked that three years later we haven't moved further than we have. I mean, that was a seminal report. It's really hard to argue with the integrity and the depth and the rigor of that report. And yet, eh. So, um, and that's probably not fair. Some movement has occurred, but not to the degree what we would have expected. Um, so again, the National Institutes of Health um, is doing other, other work here. Um, oh, I'm sorry, next page, CIFSAC. So CIFSAC is, uh, the, uh, the Chronic Fatigue Initiative Advisory Council uh, of the Department of Health Services. So now we're getting into uh, politics. And so this is, the Department of Health Services is a massive uh, federal institution. Uh, NIH is one part of it. It's, it's, there are so many. I think it's, well, I'm going to give, it, it could be like a third of the U.S. budget. I mean, it's enormous. And so there's this little chronic fatigue initiative advisory committee that's been around for about 15 years. And it's comprised of researchers, patients, uh, people with ME, um, clinicians, uh, and others, and, and people from all the key agencies within the federal government. So it's right, great concept, getting all the right people together to talk about the problems of ME uh, and move forward. And the, the organization has existed for about 15 years, and I, 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 I don't say this with any pride, but I sort of went back and checked. So the CIFSAC makes recommendations to the asso assistant chair of Department of Health and Human Services. So this is a person up, you know, 4,000 layers <laughs> within the federal government who has other things on his or her mind. Um, and so recommendations are made, recommendations are responded to. And we meet again, rinse, wash, repeat. And when you do the math and you look at um, how many, you know, anyone want to guess what percent of recommendations that have been made in the last seven years have actually been accepted and implemented by the federal government? Oh, wow, see, there's, there's, see, you're a cynic. I'm, so seven, seven percent have been implemented. Dan, you have better data? It's within the margin of error. Well, spoken like a true uh, statistician. It, I mean, whether it's zero or seven percent that have been accepted, I mean, it really is, um, it is a st astonishing from one perspective and from the perspective of really understanding the enormity of the bu bureaucracy we're dealing with. You know, it's not uh, unusual. So, and, and of course, we have a new, I don't know if you know that we have a new 
president about a year and a half ago, um, who has uh, who has failed to fill a lot of positions, uh, and we've had enormous problems with unfilled positions on CIPSAC. This is how the, you know, some of the dysfunction has trickled down, yes, even to us in ME. So um, we hope to get those open positions filled soon. Um, and um, there, is, there is a new in interest in intensity at CIPSAC, and some of us are optimistic that there may be some, uh, some movement forward. Um, we, we shall see. There are other US, oh, Congress. Oh, well, Congress. So. Um, uh, uh, Congress is a key element of <laughs> our government, and yet they seem to not pass a lot of legislation. Um, and when you come to issues like ME, it's just, it's hard to get their attention. Um, and so one of the things that our organization has done is really a concerted push. Um, two weeks ago we had, um, well, Two weeks ago was a pretty cool day for ME in the US. There was, on Saturday, Millions Missing, yay. Who here went to a Millions Missing event somewhere, anywhere? Okay, yeah. Um, so that occurred all around the world, including in DC. And then on Tuesday, our organization organized 122 different meetings with congressional leaders. Um, and, and each meeting was a constituent, so they had to listen. And we proposed two different things. One in the Senate, we proposed a pretty innocuous uh, resolution saying, you know, so the Senate urges the NIH to spend more money. The Senate urges that more attention to be, be paid to MECFS and so forth and so forth. There really weren't any teeth in it, but the way advocacy works is, you know, you get that one year and you build on it year after year. So that we got bipartisan support, Republicans and Democrats, and so that is working its way through the Senate. And on the House side, um, something with a little more teeth, we're, we're requesting a hearing. And hearing is when, like, you know, you see Zuckerberg on, you know, being grilled by the House of Representatives folks about, you know, what he's done. So that's a hearing. And a hearing on MECFS would be extraordinary because it's public uh, and anybody can see it and we're imagining, you know, the questions that would come about the lack of federal activity. So that's a, a bill that we are pushing through the, through the House, again, with bipartisan support. And, you know, I'm, I'm not going to bet my house that we'll pass either of those this year. But, but you know, it is the way advocacy works. They know we're going to come back every year, and, and we don't give up. So that's what's happening uh, with Congress. Um, uh, somebody mentioned the CDMRP money this morning, as the, which funds, which is another, you know, obscure agency of the federal government that, that um, provide, it's part, part of the Department of Defense and it's provided extraordinary funds for Gulf War illness. And as I think many of you know, the Gulf War illness and MECFS present themselves identically. And so we are, we have done the right things, met with the right committee heads to get MECFS on the list to be eligible to get funding from CDMRP. Again, a long path, but we are very focused, meeting with the right people. The case is not hard to make. Um, so working on that. And then last year is the Common Data Elements, which really was a very, is a very important project of uh, NIH CDC to, so that the research uh, is comparable between uh, different entities. So um, that is almost done, and, and that's truly a really good thing. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk even faster. Um, key policy initiatives, uh, so, uh, key advocacy. So now, so I've talked, uh, so now we're into advocacy in which our organization is pretty aggressive and also ME Action is aggressive. Um, um, I've talked about Millions Missing, MECFS advocacy on May 15th. Um, and then what's also interesting in the U.S., you know, we are a big country and, and what's happened is that individual advocate, it's like anything in the world, when does action occur? When a group of committed people get together and say, I've had enough and I'm going to make something happen. And I can't take on Congress, but I can take on the legislature in Albany, New York. And so we have begun to see some pretty extraordinary efforts at the state level, particularly in Massachusetts. There's a very, very great advocacy group in Massachusetts, New York, California, and New Jersey are especially strong. But there are, there are pockets where you're beginning to see activity. And, and the last is that there is a USA working group. This is an informal group of about 20 advocates who have a phone call once a month. And we, 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 we're pretty well structured. We have an agenda. But it's a way to share information. So what the folks did in New York 
to get the governor of New York to send out to every single clinician in New York State a special advisory about ME-CFS. How cool is that? So that happened in New York, and then the individual who really took that on, Terry Wilder, is, can show folks how to get that done in other states. So that's beginning um, to occur. Um, and then the focus of our advocacy is really on awareness, education, and building political support. And awareness is so nebulous, right? I mean, the average American, if you still say, hey, have you heard of ME, you get a blank face. And then you say, hey, have you heard of M chronic fatigue syndrome? You probably get a blank face, but nowadays you might get, yeah, I don't know, what is that? Is that that thing where you're tired all the time? And then you also get some who say, you know, that's a joke. So there's, there's just this continued undercurrent of, of uh, awareness that gets built by all these actions. Uh, and of course, the, the core advocacy focus is really, oops, um, um, is, uh, let me go to the right slide here. Um, uh, the, the, I'm not there yet. Uh, well, darn it. Um, um, Use, uh, let me also just, uh, using, the, using the media. Um, and uh, there are a number of us who now increasingly really work to place stories in consumer magazines and in, in, the, in the media about the disease. And also when we see stories now that are incorrect, we, 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 we don't catch them all, obviously, but we really try to call them out. And over time, I do think that begins to have an impact. Um, so I'm gonna move on to the clinical care crisis. Um, you know, the, a core issue in our country, you know, that is very different from, I believe, most if not all European nations is we do not have a single payer system. Our healthcare delivery system is a, is a political hotbed and it is utterly dysfunctional. Um, it is completely um, uh, decentralized. Many Ameri millions and millions of Americans have no health insurance whatsoever. You know, the, the trying to figure out how to get health insurance and find a doctor is like a day's work in itself. And, what, and so the implications of that are that um, uh, insurance companies are, are, are uncoordinated. Um, there's no consistent use of a, a medical code for MECFS. Um, doctors, you know, are very dispersed and not knowledgeable. And so there's, it makes it very difficult to educate clinicians. I'll just, I'll just say that. It makes it very difficult to educate insurance companies. It's so dispersed. And, you know, insurance companies have, you know, no incentive to, to understand this. So we're working, there are now some beginning efforts um, to work on educating clinicians. So, and I'll say no more. It is a very, very um, steep hill to climb. Um, uh, so the vast majority of Americans who go to their doctor, I, I had this just, Two years ago, I went to my, I had a new doctor, uh, uh, and good doctor, and at the, at the end of my, you know, usual stuff, new doctor, you know, in my 12.5 minute appointment, at the end she says to me, is there anything else I should know about your health? And I said, well, you know, the main health issue of my life is that I have ME, blank look. Well, you might know it as chronic fatigue syndrome. And she literally rolled her eyes. And I'm like, you're, you're messing with the wrong gal here. So, <laughs> so, so anyway, it, it did not go well, and I had to get a new doctor after that experience, but you know, that's, that's how it goes. Um, so I'm gonna keep going. Um, I'm, I'm almost there. So one of the things that we always, here, let me just go up one. Direct social support, support for patients. Again, I, I don't really have much else to say other than I admire the fact that there are numerous organizations in England, at least, and I believe elsewhere in, in Europe, that do provide support for patients, and that it just doesn't exist in the U.S., other than going online and trying to get to read some information for yourself. And any of us who, who know something about the disease, any clinician, any of our organizations, it, it, is, it, is, it is a, how do I say, it, one of the challenges of our jobs is the emotional uh, toll because we get so many desperate calls. And, and you know, you can't just say, well, we, we don't do that. We cannot help you. And so trying to manage that um, is very difficult. Um, and because and, we do understand the desperation. We do understand the depth of despair. Um, um, but no one, no one uh, has the resources to do the work that needs to be done. 
we work on a shoestring. Everything we do, we do on a shoestring. And that's true for most of the ME organizations in the US and I suspect in Europe as well. So let me hear, I'm, I'm starting to wrap up. Um, so, you know, one of the questions is just is always when, you know, when, when, when will we see change? How long will this take? And so we, we, we try, I don't know if you can read this, but we tried to sort of add a little structure to it. So um, at one of our board meetings um, two years ago, so this, what I'm gonna show you is two years old, and all of our board meetings are highly accomplished individuals who have either our patients themselves or have a family member, very close family members to patients. So these are people who get it and really care. So we just sort of broke up into groups and to discuss, okay, you know, what's your best opinion? When will we have significant NIH funding? What year? Second, when will we have the first what year will we have the first definitive biomarker? I mean, think about that. I mean, if, if we had more time, I'd say discuss among yourselves. But, um, and then the third question, when will we have the first FDA-approved drug, either new or repurposed? And I think most of us now think it'll be repurposed. But, you know, when do you think that'll happen, right? And then a deep understanding and consensus about the cause of the disease. I mean, wh honestly, how would you answer that? When do you think that'll happen? So, um, and then last, when will it become, if it's not cured, of course we all want a cure, but if short of a cure, when will it become a chronic, relatively manageable illness? In what year? You know, just as, I mean, this is probably a bad example, but AIDS, you know, uh, diabetes. You know, these are chronic, relatively well-managed illnesses. When will that occur for MECFS? In what year? So I hope you're thinking about that. Because um, we think about it in our organization, and we, we drive toward these. And so here's, here's what our board said um, two years ago. Um, we said we'd have the NIH funding by 2020. Whew, uh, you know, that's two years away. I, I, think, I think we were overly optimistic. Uh, a biomarker by next year, oh, wow, a little optimistic. FDA drug by 2023. Mm, uh, mm, oh, yeah. Um, cause of the disease, really understand it, 2030. That's kind of frightening. Um, and then a, a well managed disease by 2025. I don't know. I mean, okay, how many, here, I'm going to, I'm, now I'm going to make this interactive. Just think about it. I mean, how many people think this is too optimistic? And how many people, so I'm going to ask for raising hands. Too, uh, too optimistic, and then I'm going to say too pessimistic. Okay, first, now let's do the pessimist first. How many think this is too pessimistic and will move faster than this? Oh, wow, see, yeah, okay. How many people think it's too optimistic and it's gonna take longer than this? Yeah, okay, I, yeah, I think I'm in your camp now, yeah. But, you know, this is our focus and this is what we think about and work on. Um, so, so that's sort of the end of, um, of uh, data. <laughs> Um, and then I just want to talk about sort of how we felt. And we is the collective people I know in the MECFS community in the U.S. So this is very unscientific. Um, um, I think there's been for a long time a sense of feeling dejected and frankly exhausted. You know, and there are different kinds of exhaustion, right? A lot of people here are exhausted because it's the end of a long day, right? A lot of people are exhausted because we've had a Long, uh, you know, uh, time zone change, yeah. And then some of us are exhausted at the molecular level, right? <laughs> so I got all three. <laughs> uh, and I, I would wager everyone here has at least one. Um, and so we're frustrated, I think, that the battle has taken so much longer than we expected. I mean, I know I feel that way. This battle has taken so much longer than we expected. And there are veterans in this room, Dan, I'm not looking at you, who have been at this for so long and are still at it. And, you know, it's extraordinary. And I think, I mean, this is now getting, um, I, I also feel frustrated that others don't see this injustice and take up arms with us. I mean, that really amazes me. You know, people will take up, in, when, when there's an injustice, we've seen the Me Too movement. We've seen, you know, people who are concerned about racism. We've seen people who are concerned about AIDS. We've seen people who are concerned about, you know, 
why is this disease, why do people not see the injustice, and I see it as an injustice, and take up arms with us? Um, and that's, of course, it's sort of a marketing problem that we think about all the time. But I find that very, very frustrating. Um, but there's also a passion that's strived for, from the, just the injustice. And I think most of us who, who work in this field all, still can hold on to that passion for it. And we are invigorated by the few successes, right? I mean, come on, unrest, you know, that was a gift, right? And there are things that are happening that truly are gifts and signs of change. Um, and so how else have we felt? Last thing I put was empathetic, um, because I think everyone here knows how much suffering is occurring. Um, so uh, I would say that looking forward, you know, how will bringing MECFS into its appropriate place in the constellation of diseases occur? That's a little, it's a little bulky, but I mean, that's how I think about it. You know, every, you know, diseases sort of take their place. So that we sort of know where to put MS now. We sort of know where to put breast cancer now. When will MECFS come into its appropriate place in the constellation of diseases? This is mean people understand it. There's care uh, and so on. I, I think it's going to be a very, I think it's been virtually flat for decades. And we're beginning to just see a little bit of a, a, an upward curve. And I do think there'll come a point when the flywheel will start to spin. And we'll get that momentum going. And you know, we've seen unrest. We know the good work that's happening at OMF. We, we hope we're doing good work. Europe, the rest of the world, and many, many others are just doggedly. I mean, who here is like going to give up on this? No one. No one. We are on it. We are dogged. Um, and so I do think there will be periods, again, of little movement. And then I think, there, I think that then we can have a lot. I mean, I think that day can come. Um, so uh, uh, just a couple closing thoughts, last slide. Um, I, I see this as a worldwide civil rights movement. That's how I think of it. Um, and we are all in this together. You know, this is, a, this is an issue that knows no boundaries, right? In national boundaries. Um, we deal with different government structures, we deal with different healthcare delivery structures, but this is an issue that knows no boundaries. And it, it doesn't feel like it, right? But we are making history. We are making history. Um, you know, one of the things that, you know, no one is here for the money, right? I mean, most, you know, most, Conventions I've gone to are people who are in business. I've come from the business world and people are motivated to make money. This is such a different fundamental motivation um, um, that, that is sustainable and will drive us with passion. Um, and so let me just, you know, I think about, I'm, I'm old enough that when I was a kid growing up, you'd see kids with, we could now call it autism. Then we just knew it was like the weird kid. And, but it was, it was accepted wisdom that autism was caused by bad parenting, right? I, some of you remember this, cold parenting, refrigerator moms. And when I think about, and I believed it well into my 20s and 30s, I, I thought that's what, what autism was. And when I think about, I feel sh ashamed that I blamed those parents when they were suffering in the way they were with those children who desperately needed help. And I do know that there will be a day, I don't believe in, purposely shaming people, but there will be a day when people will feel shame that they ignored and, sh and shunned their suffering friends, and we all know people who have this who are ignored or shunned by family members and friends. There will be a day when doctors will feel ashamed that they turned away their patients or diagnosed them with dis depression when it is so wrong. And they'll, they'll be ashamed that they did not fund this disease as generously as it deserves to be funded. Um, so again, I honor so many who've gone before us. Um, all of us in this room, we're people with ME, we're journalists, government bureaucrats, researchers, advocates. Um, we're not all here, but really Richard has assembled an extraordinary group. We are all in this together. This is regardless of nation. This is an international civil rights issue, and, and I'll just, I, I, I love to come to these events because I feel so proud to serve with all of you. So thank you. <laughs>